Okay, so this is the first of our video lectures that we're doing for AMP1. And we were able to get through all of our intro chapters. So the packet that you should be looking at should be your chemistry packet. So that is the one that I'm going to be covering this evening. Um, any notes that you want to take, you can go ahead and jot down on that. Um, please remember that <clears throat> the test information is going to cover material that we talk about in these video lectures as well. So as you guys are taking notes, um, make sure that you realize that this is testable information as well. Um, looking at chemistry, even though when we talk about anatomy and physiology, that would technically fall under the tent of being a biology field, we still need to talk about chemistry when we look at anything that has to do with biological sciences. And that's because in order to fully understand how the human body works, you also have to have a foundation understanding of how chemistry works because so much of what happens in the human body is going to be explained through the basics of chemistry. So we don't go into huge depth. Like I said, it's just that foundation knowledge that you need to. Um, I'm hoping that some of you in your past have a little bit of chemistry background. If you don't, don't worry. Um, we'll kind of go through everything that you need. So if you've had chemistry in the past, it's going to be a refresher. If this is kind of new for you, then um, we are going to work through it at a pace in a way that hopefully it works for you as well. So looking at chemistry, um, a chemistry it takes things back one step. So when we talk about biology, we're really focusing on the cell because that is the most basic unit that we have in biology. That is our smallest functional unit. Uh, and when we talk about chemistry, we're going to, like I said, take it back one step and we're going to look at things that are even smaller than the cell. We're going to look at the actual building blocks, so to speak, of cells and the other materials that make up the human body. So when we talk about chemistry, um, it says a look at how different substances are made and how they can be changed. So with chemistry, a lot of what happens is going to be based on three particles, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. The proton has a positive charge to it, the neutron has no charge, it's neutral, and then the electron has a negative charge. And if you guys go back to when you were little, if you ever played with magnets, you know that you could take two magnets and when you got them close enough together, they would actually attract to each other. And you could take different magnets and when you got them in close proximity to each other, you could actually feel a push as they were repelling against each other. Those same basic concepts that work with magnets are also the same basic concepts that are going to work within the human body to get things in position where they need to be so that the body can use them. Sometimes we want things to come together. And so we would put a positive and that negative charge next to each other, let them come together and interact so that we get a particular reaction to happen within the body. At other times, we don't want a reaction to happen. And so in that case, the body's going to use two light charges and get that repel or that pushing away so that something doesn't take place until we're ready for it. So that's really how chemistry plays into the human body. If you look at the second slide, it talks about the structure of matter. And when we look at the structure of matter, um, atoms are going to be the most basic unit in chemistry. And that is the smallest form of any one of the elements. And you can't take an atom and make it any smaller and still have it be that same element that you were dealing with before. So just how the cell is the most basic unit in biology, atom is the most basic unit that you guys have in chemistry. When you talk about elements, elements are what you find on the periodic table. And most of the elements are going to be things that you could find out in nature naturally occurring. There are some elements uh, that have been created in laboratories or man-made. Um, and so you get this different kind of blend of elements when you look at the, the periodic table. But those are all the different um, materials that you have uh, within the world. So it says naturally, 90 are naturally occurring and 26 have been man-made. The difference between the elements that are naturally occurring and the ones that are man-made, typically the reason that they have to be man-made is because they are incredibly unstable and they only have a lifespan of a few seconds. And that's why we don't find them out in the natural world because even if for some reason they would happen, um, their lifespan is so, so short that they'd be over before we ever had a chance to find them. The last slide that you have on that first page talks about a st atomic structure. 
And when we look at atoms, how they're put together is incredibly important because it really is the basic understanding of how things are able to interact. Now, I used the example earlier of magnets and that you guys know laws of attraction, opposites attract, like charges repel. So if you put a positive and a negative in close proximity to each other, they're going to attract to one another. If you have one positive, it attracts one negative. If you have three positives, it's going to attract three negatives. So you want that balance between the number of positives that you have and the number of negatives that you have. In the case of light charges, if you put a positive next to a positive, they don't want to interact. They don't want to be around each other. So that's that repel or that push that you feel. Likewise, a negative and a negative in close proximity are going to push against each other. So the atomic structure is kind of like a cell. If you think back to the core of a cell, it has that nucleus. And likewise with an atom, we have that central core. And in the nucleus of an atom, you are going to find two out of the three particles. So earlier I talked about the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. In the nucleus, you find those protons and you find the neutrons. So in that very central core of an atom, you are going to have all the positive charges and all of the neutral charges, those particles that don't have any charge whatsoever. So if you put a bunch of positives with a bunch of neutrals, Think about what that overall charge is going to be of that nucleus. Positives with neutrals, there's nothing to cancel out that positive charge. So that nucleus of an atom is going to give off a positive attraction. Now, if you go back to magnets again, like charges are going to attract to each other. So if the atom has created this central core that gives off a positive charge, what is it going to draw to it? that's where the electrons come in. So floating around that nucleus, you guys are going to have those electrons. Now, if you did ever take a chemistry class and you had to draw out what an atom looked like, you would draw your circle, you would show your protons and your neutrons inside that circle, that nucleus, and then you would draw rings around that and you would use those rings to then place the electrons. And depending on how many electrons you have would determine how many rings you draw out. The thing that you need to keep in mind is that those rings that you drew to show where the electrons would be around that nucleus, that is a figment of our imagination. That is something that we have created because as humans, we like to have something that we can actually see and attach those electrons to, but that's not the way an atom actually works. You have that central nucleus giving off that positive charge, and then the electrons are kind of like moths or bugs drawn to a light on a dark night. And if you think about a light that's on in the evening when it gets dark outside, what happens? The bugs all fly to it and then they kind of drift away and then they come back and they're just kind of in and out, but they're not in a fixed location. And that's exactly how the electrons behave. So if you've got that central positive core, those electrons are floating around it, but they are not in a fixed location. We do that for our purposes, just so we can make sense of it. Now, if you have an atom that has one proton and one, excuse me, one neutron in that nucleus, then it's going to draw one electron to it. So then that electron will kind of float around. If you have five protons and five neutrons in your nucleus, now you're going to draw five electrons and they're going to float around that nucleus. Now, in the scheme of things, when we draw out there are going to be electrons that stay closer or float closer to the nucleus. And that first ring or that first level around the nucleus is going to hold a max of two electrons. After that, the if there's any electrons left over, so let's say we have an atom that, okay, if we take carbon, carbon has an atomic number of six. An atomic number indicates how many protons a particular element has. And you can tell a lot of information just by that atomic number. So you know for sure that that particular element has six protons, always has to have six protons. When the number of protons changes, the element that you are dealing with changes. So if you look at the periodic table, number six on the periodic table is going to be carbon. 
right off the bat, you know it's got six protons. And we're going to pretend like right now we're living in a perfect world. So if it had six protons, it would also have six neutrons. So now we've got that nucleus with our six protons, our six neutrons hanging out. And those six positive charges for the protons are going to attract six electrons. Two of those six electrons are going to hover in that first level or that first area right around the nucleus but we still have four electrons left over. They're going to go to the next layer or the next orbital, and those four will float in that space. So that first shell can hold a max of two. The second shell can hold a max of eight. So for our purposes, we really don't do too much past those first two levels of electrons, but just know that the first level or the first layer around that nucleus 